we are ready to start. So um, I'll uh, make a like, short announcement in Korean first, and then uh, like, uh, uh, and then uh, English uh, announcement, and then you can start, right? Okay. But I can't deliver, I can't, I don't know how to deliver my talk in Korean though. <laughs> good. Anyway, uh, if there are any uh, questions in Korean, I will just translate them to you and, and then you can uh, handle that from there. Okay. Uh, 자, 그, talk, 오늘 시리즈를 시작을 하도록 하겠습니다. 중간에 어, 그, 혹시 대부분 질문을 보통 어, 그, 챗, 칭찬에 보통 많이 하시니까 채팅창에 해주시고 어, 오늘 주로 인터랙티브한 어, 세미나를 원하시니까 네, 중간 중간에 질문을 하셔도 좋을 것 같습니다. 네, 그리고 뭐 끝난 다음에 질문하셔도 좋고. Okay, so let me switch back to English and uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Professor David Se. Uh, he's at the Stanford University. And um, uh, he, uh, he had a numerous awards. Uh, I, there's so many, so I'll just name her a few major awards. Um, he's uh, elected a member of US National Academy of Engineering in 2018. And also uh, he received the, the revered uh, Shannon Award uh, in 2017. This is a, a colloquium for uh, uh, Shannon meets a, a Turing uh, kind of uh, uh, interaction. So this is kind of, uh, uh, I mean, he's the, uh, the best suited speaker for this series, I guess. And uh, he also received a, a prestigious Hemming Medal in 2019. And there are so many other awards that I don't have time to mention. And he's a, uh, 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 he also uh, uh, published a textbook, a very well-known textbook. I guess most of the graduate students here uh, are using actually for their self-study and for courses. Actually, uh, David, your textbook is very popular among grad students here in Korea too. Yes, actually, when I was visiting uh, mm -hmm. Seoul a few many mm -hmm. years ago, yeah. I saw my book in a general textbook. Yeah, that's uh, no wonder. Store, which, <laughs> which has never happened, which would never happen in the U.S. Oh, that's that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the the name of the textbook was uh, is a uh, fundamentals of wireless communications, and uh, actually, I, I read it once, and it's. Uh, so well written and uh, I, I really I like the book. Anyway, uh, without much ado, let me, uh, let us welcome uh, Professor David Se, and he's going to talk about some uh, new latest uh, blockchain technologies. Okay, go ahead, David. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. Thank you very much for inviting me here to give this talk at this uh, great meeting. So Shannon meets Turing, uh, is a good description of my research, especially in the past decade. My research has been focused on trying to understand the interplay between computation and communication. So I'm very glad to give this talk here. Um, so uh, I did not prepare a large number of slides because I figure I will make this talk a bit more interactive. So if you have any questions, please shout or just enter a question in the chat box and I'll try my best to respond to uh, your question, either in the middle of the talk or at the end. Okay, so the title of today's talk is a Byzantine Consensus Theory Through the Lens of Information Theory. And I'll try to explain uh, what I mean here. And uh, part of this work is published at the IEEE Symposium on Security and Privacy, uh, just a few days ago, we presented it. And if you're interested, you can take a look at the paper after the talk. So the starting point of this research is uh, from a paper that we were reading about a year ago. So anyone who follows cryptocurrencies will know that uh, the number one cryptocurrency is Bitcoin. 
The number two cryptocurrency is uh, Ethereum. And Ethereum for the past uh, five years have been trying to uh, upgrade the system from proof of work, so-called proof of work, which requires a lot of energy to proof of stake. And so they were busy designing a a new blockchain protocol for Ethereum 2.0. And this paper is about the design that they are going to put into Ethereum 2.0, which was just, uh, uh, came out a few months ago, actually. This paper was written a year ago. And um, while we were studying this paper, we realized that actually this protocol is not secure. And we came up with an attack on this protocol. And uh, so that leads us to an interesting question, which is how do you design a secure protocol to achieve the objectives that the Ethereum 2.0 people want to accomplish? And uh, through one year of research, we finally succeeded in doing that. Uh, And uh, today I'm gonna tell you sort of the story of how we get to the final product of this research. And the story started almost 40 years ago, okay? So to start the story, I have to talk to you about sort of this whole field of consensus algorithms. So since this talk is about Shannon meets Turing, so let's start with Shannon then, okay? So Shannon in 1948 wrote a groundbreaking paper called the Mathematical Theory of Communication. And in this paper, he formulated the problem of reliable communication. So here it is, the famous figure one in this paper. We have an encoder decoder that tries to introduce us redundancy into the communication. And the channel is unreliable, but yet at the same time, you want to achieve reliable communication. Okay, so what Shannon accomplished is basically to design a method to convert an unreliable system through this noisy channel into a reliable abstraction, almost like a noiseless communication link. And this abstraction is what powers the information age. We are we now know that when we push bits in one place on the earth, then we can get bits out on the other place of the earth. And thanks to Shannon, we are able to do this in an efficient manner. And uh, so Shannon's theory is really asking the question, which is what are the fundamental limits for reliable communication? Okay, so that's the story of communication. Now, in uh, 40 years later, in the early 1980s, another group of people looked at a seemingly different set of problem And I call this problem a consensus problem. So here in this problem, we have a bunch of nodes which are distributed potentially around the world at different places. They're communicating with each other. And the objective is the following, that at different nodes, different people may enter different sequence of some people call it commands, some people call it transactions. And, um, and you have to, and the goal of the system is that although the commands or the transactions that input at different nodes could be different, the goal is that they come to an agreement on a common ledger, common ledger. And this ledger is what the goal is, okay? Now, in the 1980s, their goal was to create so-called reliable or replicable state machine, which is to imitate one central machine through this network of distributed nodes. And the goal is to be able to accomplish reliable performance, despite the fact that some of these nodes may be malfunctioning or may be evil and tries to disrupt the system. So therefore, The goal of this problem is to accomplish a so-called reliable state machine replication. That is transactions come in at different nodes and a common agreed upon ledger is outputted by this 
replication machine, state machine replication. And the two important properties that you want to achieve is so-called safety and liveness. So safety means basically that if you agree on something, you won't change your mind later. Liveness means that when new transactions come in, they will eventually enter into this ledger. That is, you don't get stuck forever. And so therefore this whole branch of uh, research and uh, practice started with this question of what is the fundamental limits of reliable distributed computing, okay? So you can see that actually, although the two areas, communication and consensus looks quite different, but at the heart, the goal is to accomplish the following. That is, you have a system which is made of unreliable components, okay? And your job is to accomplish through building sp smart algorithms to achieve a reliable abstraction, okay? In one case, reliable communication. In the other case, reliable computing, okay? So this is a good example, I think, where Shannon meets Turing, computing and communication. And of course, this consensus problem became really important, particularly in the past 10 years with blockchains, with Bitcoin and all other projects. And so if you look at the Bitcoin problem, the transactions are basically transactions on Bitcoin. Alice pays Bob one Bitcoin. And the ledger is of course very important, which is to define how many Bitcoins which individual has. And this is so important that this ledger is safe, that has never changed. Because if it's changed, then obviously some people will lose money and some people will gain money and the whole system will go havoc. So this problem, although invented 40 years ago, uh, become particularly important in the past decade. And, um, and so basically the Ethereum problem was trying to solve this consensus problem in a, a new way. And uh, so the way we approach that problem is to ask the question, okay, consensus and communication are very similar seems somewhat similar. How can we try to borrow ideas from communication to solve some interesting consensus problem? And in particular, to solve this problem that Ethereum 2.0 was trying to solve. And so that's what we did. Now, interestingly, although these two areas are somewhat similar in flavor, there's actually been very little cross pollinization, cross fertilization between these two areas. And I think our, pub, our uh, research here is one such example. Okay, all right. So in communication, the main object of interest, okay, is the channel. So a lot of work has been done on studying different channels, wireless channel, wireline channel, optical channel, blah, 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 many channels. And in Consensus is the same thing. And in the consensus case, a channel is replaced by the network. That is the, the network which connects all these nodes. And different models of this network leads to different fundamental limits, okay? And so the whole research field you can think of as studying different models of the network and leading to different fundamental limit performance and different types of algorithms, protocols. So the story started with the simplest network, the simplest channel. And it's a so-called synchronous channel. And this is a synchronous model. And this was studied in the original work by Lamport. This was the model that was used in Lamport, Shostak and Pease. Uh, Lamport is a Turing Award winner uh, for uh, much of it for particularly this body of work in addition to other pieces of work. And in the synchronous model is very simple, is that the delay of communication is bounded within a parameter delta, which is a network bound. And they show the following theorem, 
that the consensus can be achieved even only if less than 50% of the nodes are adversary. So this is an example of a statement of fundamental limits, it, which is to say that you can achieve consensus if half the nodes are con uh, adversary. And if more than half the nodes are adversary, then you cannot achieve consensus by any protocol. Okay, so below 50%, you can find a protocol. And Dolef Strong is one example of such a protocol. But beyond that, you cannot by any protocol. So this statement sets a fundamental limit for this problem. Okay, good. So this is the simplest model called a synchronous model. So this is Lamport 1982, the first model. Now, what happened after this model was published, was used in Lamport, then people start rec recognizing, well, this synchronous model is a bit too strong. In a lot of realistic situation, you may lose synchrony. Maybe you don't lose synchrony all the time, but maybe you lose synchrony some of the time. Maybe sometimes you violate the delay bound. And uh, that leads to a two important extension of this basic model, okay? In the first extension uh, by a very important paper by Dwork and Al, 1988, it leads to a model called partially synchronous that we'll explain a little bit later. That was 1988. And when Nakamoto came up with his work on Bitcoin, he actually, together with Bitcoin, the protocol, he also came up with actually a new model, which goes beyond synchrony, which I call dynamic participation, which I'll also explain later. So synchrony, synchronous model branches into two important families of models. And these two families of model essentially leads to two worlds of consensus protocols. So in this world of blockchain, there's basically two classes, two major classes of blockchain protocols. And some of them follow Nakamoto and some of them follow the partially synchronous family. And uh, here are some examples that you may have heard of. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano uh, on the one side and hot stuff, Tendermint on the right hand side. So basically you can think of the world of blockchain is partitioned into these two types of protocols. So let me explain to you what each of the protocols or each of the models look like. So today I'm gonna to put more emphasis on the models rather than the protocols. And then I'll formulate the problem that we are interested in solving for the Ethereum 2.0 system, okay? So remember in synchrony, the delay is bounded by delta, right? So all the messages Communication messages are bounded by delta. Partial synchronous model says that, you know, every now and then, every now and then, you can violate this delay bound, okay? And in particular, you can even, the network can even partition for a while, okay? And the goal is that you should retain safety even with the network partitions and if the network rejoins, then you should have liveness, okay? So what does that mean? So first, the so statement is that if you want to achieve this goal, Dwork and Al prove the following theorem, which says that consensus can be achieved now with a stronger requirement, that is, 50% is not enough, you need fewer, 33% adversary, one third. And beyond one third, you cannot achieve consensus in this more harsh model. So this is kind of an interesting model. So what I'm gonna do is to give you a plot, okay? And this plot is kind of uh, important. So let me explain what this plot is. So as a function of time, okay, I'm gonna measure the length of the ledger, okay? The length of the ledger. And you can see that in the gray area, the network partition, 
So when you run this protocol, you, an example, a typical protocol like for this model, you will see that the ledger, okay, actually grows when the network is not partitioned, but when the network is partitioned, the ledger stops growing. And then when the network joins again, then the ledger continues to grow. So the ledger continues to grow here, okay? So the ledger continues to grow here, grows here, but in the middle it stops with a network partition, okay? And uh, the reason is the following. When the network partitions, then you have a problem because you don't know what the other, one, one side doesn't know what the other side is doing. So if you try to confirm transactions, then you're concerned that the other side is confirming some other transactions, which is inconsistent with yours, such that when the network rejoins, then you have a conflicting set of transactions. So that's why protocols like this, they're very smart in the sense that when they know, when they can sense, that the network has partitioned, then they will stop tra confirming transactions. And when the network joins again, okay, then it will, you will confirm, continue to infringe transaction and your protocol is live, okay? So this is a partially synchronous protocol. And um, here are the fundamental limits. Now, this has been sort of the main model that consensus community has been using for many years, since 1988. In 2008, okay, Nakamoto came up with Bitcoin. So that's the birth of Bitcoin in a white paper, famous white paper. In 2008, Nakamoto wrote a paper, white paper describing the Bitcoin protocol, the system, the Bitcoin system, and, but very interestingly, is actually solving also a consensus problem, but in a very different environment than the one that Lamport has been thinking about, okay? So Lamport was thinking about a consensus problem in sort of like a, you know, closed system, okay? That you have a bunch of nodes and they're distributed maybe, but it's controlled by a single organization. So think about Google tries to set up a, or Amazon sort of set up a cloud with a bunch of nodes providing redundancy to the computing so that when one when the subset fails, the whole thing can still run, continue running. So that's a setting that Lamport has in their mind, okay? Now Bitcoin, although it's solving the same problem of consensus, now, is actually a very different environment. So Bitcoin is supposed to run on an environment where there is no fixed set of nodes. It's open participation. Everybody who wants to participate in Bitcoin can join the network to participate. In, in particular in Bitcoin, you join by uh, sort of pro contributing computing power to support Bitcoin's consensus. And if you don't feel like that, you can leave anytime you want. So you can join and leave. And here's an example of such a setting. So this is the plot of the activity or the participation rate at Bitcoin since 2018, since the beginning, 2019, since the inception of Bitcoin in the past uh, 12 years. I'm plotting the hash rate, okay? which is the amount of computational power that's spent on Bitcoin. And you can see that it changes a lot over the years. Sometimes it's very high, sometimes very low, et cetera, okay? So Bitcoin being an open consensus protocol tries to achieve consensus even in this environment called dynamic participation, okay? And uh, what is dynamic participation? So one, one can set up a model for that. The model here is that you have a bunch of nodes and when they are online, they communicate, say within a delayed delta. And then some of the nodes may disappear. They leave, they're not mining anymore. Maybe because 
energy is too expensive, they decide to stop mining, or maybe Bitcoin value is too low, it's not worth mining, they leave, and then they rejoin. And those that rejoin, they can communicate with each other in a synchronous network. And so the interesting question was, okay, what is the fundamental limit under this model? And this question was answered in 2015 by a groundbreaking paper by Gere and L, which shows that consensus can be achieved again with 50%, back to 50%. But now 50% of the online notes are adversary. So as long as less than 50% of the online nodes are adversary, then consensus can be achieved, because that's the theorem. Okay, now here's one interesting thing about this protocol or this that Bitcoin came up with, uh, Nakamoto came up with, is that now if you plot, okay, the ledger length as I did earlier, then you can see that the ledger always grows, whether the participation is low or high, it always grows. That's the interesting thing about Bitcoin, is that it never stops. And the reason why it never stops is because when the number of users, number of nodes drop, then it senses that, hey, people are not interested in the protocol, less people are interested. So there's no reason for it to stop running just because fewer miners are mining. So it will adjust itself and continue to mine and continue to confirm transactions. So the two types of protocols, partial synchronous and dynamic participation is like two different channels. The protocols that are optimal in each of the environment has very different behavior. Partially synchronous is a very conservative type of protocol. Whenever it can sense that fewer nodes, it can hear from fewer nodes, then it will stop confirming. And it will only confirm you when it hears from more nodes. In Bitcoin, it will keep on confirming transactions even though there are fewer nodes or more nodes, doesn't matter. Okay, and uh, so people notice that, hey, there are these two very different types of protocol. And this is best illustrated by this picture. So here we have a dynamic set of users increasing and decreasing, and there's also network partition. Let's put everything together. And if you run the Bitcoin protocol on this environment, then you will see that the ledger continues to grow no matter what. Whereas if you run the partial synchronous protocol, then it will stop growing when it senses very few nodes around and continues to grow when there are more nodes around. So in fact, the two types of protocol is offering two important features of a blockchain system. One feature, is called dynamic availability. That is, although there's dynamic participation, it's always available. The other feature, people call it finality. That is, because it's conservative, so when you confirm transactions, okay, then even though the network has partitioned, you guarantee that if you do confirm transactions, they can never be reversed. So Bitcoin is kind of more aggressive because it's kind of thinking that if there are lower participation rate, it's just that many people went offline. They're not like building another chain to try to compete with my chain. So it continues to confirm. Whereas partial synchronous protocol is more conservative. So both features, dynamic availability and finality are important features of a blockchain protocol. And so people have been asking this question, well, can one build a consensus protocol that provides both an availability and finality? Okay. Is there such a protocol? Now, if you look at the picture, then the obvious answer is no, because a protocol that's available 
has to keep on growing. And a, a, a protocol that provides finality has to stop growing when there are not enough nodes that it can hear from. So there is no way you can design protocol that would be able to achieve both properties. And so the answer is no. And this is so-called availability finality dilemma. You can only have one of such property. So many protocols out there basically pick. They're either available like Bitcoin or Cardano or Ethereum 1.0, or they provide finality like hot stuff. Tendermint, they provide finality. And so what Ethereum 2.0 is trying to accomplish is in some sense trying to get the best of both worlds, okay? Unfortunately, the protocol is not secure, but the goal is kind of interesting. And so we, what we did in our work is to try to, number one, formulate, formalize the goal, and number two, trying to provide an optimal solution to that goal. Okay, so after some thinking about this problem, we formulate a resolution of this dilemma. And the solution is the following. We know we cannot provide availability and finality at the same time. Okay, so we are going to do the next best thing. What are we going to do? So we're going to provide a ledger and this ledger I call available ledger. And this ledger is always available, continue to grow. And then we're gonna provide a prefix of this ledger, which we call finalized ledger. And this ledger is always guaranteed to be final, provide finality. That is, even though the network partition, this ledger transactions there is still saved. So, this two ledger, the desired property is the following, is that the available ledger, okay, keeps on growing, whereas the finalized ledger being a prefix, okay, will grow when there are enough nodes around but when the participation rate is low or the network has partitioned, it can sense that there are few nodes around and it's not so sure anymore. It will be smart enough to be conservative. Okay. And conservative means that it won't grow anymore. And it will only grow when the, it senses that there is enough level of participation. And when it grows, it will be able to catch up with the available ledger, okay? So here, at this point, it's catching up. It's catching up with the available ledger, but then sometimes it lags behind, okay? So this is a good uh, feature to have this dual ledger. And here's why, okay? Imagine you're running Ethereum system and you want to use the system to do transactions, okay? Now, if you want to do transactions, then there are two types of transactions. Let's think about it. There are transactions that you, th you find very important. Maybe they're very big transactions. Like for example, buying a car. And there are transactions which are very small transactions like buying a cup of coffee. So if your transaction is very small, what you want is you want to actually get this transaction confirmed fast, okay? In which case, if this transaction is in the available ledger, then you should be happy and say, okay, let's, let's move on. Let's get the coffee and transact. You don't have to wait until your transaction enters the finalized ledger. On the other hand, if you are buying a car, then you better wait until your transaction is in the finalized ledger before you go forward and confirm that transaction and give away your car, okay? Or, or give away your Bitcoin to buy the car, okay? 
So the dual ledger sort of allows you flexibility to, uh, to do that. And everyone, however, can agree on the finalized ledger because that one, is completely agreed upon by everybody, whether you are buying a coffee or buying a car, or whether you are conservative or whether you're aggressive, okay? All right, so this is the goal that we want to achieve, okay? This is the goal we want to achieve. The question, and we call this security property, we call it app and flow. Why app and flow? Because if you look at the red and the blue, Sometimes the blue catches up with the red. Sometimes it lags behind the blue, just like waves, app and flow, okay? And so there, once we formulate the property mathematically, then we ask, is there a protocol which can achieve this property? And in our paper, we've constructed the first protocol that achieved this property in a provable way, okay? So early attempts like um, Ethereum 2.0 solution was not secure. And so, uh, and our solution is secure. So the theorem is that we can build a consensus protocol pi that can generate a dual ledger, two ledger. One is always available, always growing. And one is final, always provide finality, called finalized ledger. And the blue is the prefix of the red always, okay? And it comes with the following security property. The blue one is secure under partially synchronous condition, network partition, as long as less than 33% of the nodes is adversary. While the available ledger is secure under dynamic participation as long as less than 50% of the nodes is adversary, okay? So you uh, can see, you, yeah. Uh, are there any kind of uh, overlapping kind of content between these two types of ledgers? Uh, yes, that's mm -hmm. a very good question. Thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. So the blue is a prefix of the red. So there's a lot of overlapping. Every transactions in the blue is a transaction in the red. Mm -hmm. So let me go back, right? So this is the red, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The blue is on top of the red. Ah, so the blue okay. is actually a prefix ledger. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. Because you know, to build a consensus protocol that generates two ledger is kind of trivial mm -hmm. because you can just put together a Bitcoin protocol, for example, to generate the red, and you can put together a partial synchronous protocol to generate the blue. So it's a trivial problem, right? Okay. So, so, so for example, right, you can put Bitcoin here, and that generates the available ledger, and you can put in a partially synchronous protocol, okay, as a BFT protocol, so to speak, or hot stuff that would generate the blue ledger, but they have nothing to do with each other, right? Mm -hmm. There's no consensus. There's no agreement between these two ledgers. So that's not very interesting. It's kind of a trivial problem. But the point is we want agreement between these two guys so that everybody can agree on at least the blue part, the kind of important part. And at the same time, we allow this available ledger to continue to grow all the time so that this thing is live and continues adding transactions. Okay, and uh, there's a uh, one like a short question on the chat board. Or... Yeah, please. Sorry, I'm, I, I'm not looking at the chat box anymore, but I could, yes. Let okay. me just, thanks for letting me know because it was, oh, there was one question. Good, yeah. all right. Excuse okay. me, I have a simple quick question. Okay. What does ledger length means? Okay, good. All right, so Tikon asked, what is the, what does ledger length mean? So that's the important question. So in other words, what am I plotting here? So let me see here one second. Okay. So what does ledger length means? So what is ledger? Okay. If you go back to the first slide, the ledger is a sequence of transactions. Okay. 
sequence of transaction. Alice pays Bob one Bitcoin is one transaction. Bob pays Charlie one Bitcoin is another transaction. So a ledger is a record of all the transactions that have gone on in the system. And the important thing is that the consensus protocol allows every node to have the same ledger. In other words, the same ordering of the transactions. That makes sure that everyone is in agreement on how many Bitcoins Alice owns, how many Bitcoin Charlie owns, okay? Now the length of the ledger refers to how many transactions is in the ledger at the, any moment. So the longer the ledger, that means the more transactions you have confirmed, okay? So therefore you want a system that keeps on growing as fast as possible, but at the same time securely. So that's why the length of the ledger is important. Mm -hmm. Do I answer the question properly? Okay, all right. Okay, all right. So that's why I always plot the ledger length because the ledger length is the sign of how live this protocol is. If you keep on moving forward, then you are always available. If you stop growing, that means you're no longer confirming new transactions. Okay? All right. Okay, good. All right. So, all right. So we prove a theorem which says that it is possible to build a protocol that generates a finalized ledger and a available ledger such that the finalized ledger is a prefix of the red ledger, just like what Professor Lee just asked. And the blue ledger is secure as long as less than 33% adversary under network partition and the available ledger is secure under dynamic partition less than 50% on line nodes adversary. You recall that these two are precisely the fundamental limits in the two settings of partially synchronous and dynamic participation. So what we're saying is that we can achieve optimality for both ledgers, for both ledgers individually with the additional constraint that they are prefix of each other. So that is the accomplishment of such a theorem, okay? So I can provide two ledgers to you, each of which is optimally secure, hitting the fundamental limits of their individual network environments, but at the same time, they are consistent with each other, okay? Now, I won't go into too much detail about the protocol, the solution, but you can think of the solutions roughly looks like this on the left side. So we have designed this, We've actually implemented this to run on EC2 nodes. So let me share with you a little bit of how the protocol works. So this solution is a so-called a checkpointing mechanism. Is that, so you first run a protocol, which is like a Nakamoto protocol. It is called a longest chain protocol. So for people who've heard of Nakamoto Bitcoin, you know it's called longest chain protocol. And basically this longest chain protocol have a chain of blocks. That's why it's called blockchain. Keep on running, okay? And what we do is we have a, we add a so-called finality gadget, okay? Which votes on these blocks, okay? So they keep on growing and I vote in such a way that I figure out, okay, I checkpoint these blocks to make sure that, okay, I, I think these blocks are finalized. Meanwhile, this chain continues to grow. And then this guy keeps on trying to catch up to finalize it, okay? And when there are not enough nodes around, this chain will continue growing, but this thing, finalization will stop. And then when there is more participation, it will continue to grow, okay? So this is called a checkpointing mechanism, but our design is secure, okay? And you can think of Ethereum 2.0 was trying to do a similar thing, but unfortunately the design was not secure. And we, so we thought we will run it on a environment which is very similar to Ethereum 2.0 with about 4,000 validators. 
uh, and we ran it on the same scale and we showed that our protocol is actually our implementation scalable, we wrote it in Rust. And here you can see the ledger length growing and you can see that the finalized prefix uh, sometimes lag behind and then catch up, sometimes lag behind and catch up, lag behind and catch up, etc. okay? And it's behind by about uh, a few of the order of a few hundred seconds, okay? So a few minutes. All right, so that's our experiment. Okay, so now we have come to finally a solution of Ethereum original problem. And you may think, well, okay, so what is the connection of all this with information theory? Because after all this talk is about Shannon meets Turing, so where is Shannon? So it turns out that our inspiration for this formulation came from a formulation in information theory. So in information theory, okay, remember this picture, we have in communication through a channel, but this is actually the most basic communication setting. It's called point-to-point -point communication point-to-point -point communication. And uh, the wider range of problems is called network communication, where there are more than just one person talking to another person. So for example, here's a concrete example called broadcast channel, where you have a single encoder trying to communicate to two receivers through two different channels, okay? And you try to simultaneously communicate to them, okay? And if you think about it, what we are doing in the app and flow property is precisely like a broadcast channel where we're trying to create not one, not communicate to one user, but to two users. One user wants the finalized ledger. The other user wants the available ledger and the constraint is that it's like you're sending a bunch of information bits. One user wants the prefix, the other user wants the whole thing. And this problem was actually studied in information theory in 1977 by Corner and Maton. It's called broadcasting with degraded message set. That means that you wanna communicate say video and one node, okay, once uh, is very weak, one channel is very weak and they can only get the important bits, the first few bits. One node has a very good channel so they can see all the bits, okay? And so what we find here in this problem is that because we have like two network environment, one is partial synchronous and one is uh, dynamic participation, they're very different. So it's impossible to send all the bits simultaneously to both users, okay? So what we can do, the best that we can do is to have one user have the, a few of the important bits and another user have all the bits. So basically that's the analogy that we drew on this problem. Okay, so this is the paper. If you're interested, take a look. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, please, you can shoot. Okay, Professor Lee, that's it for my talk. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, uh, let's say, uh, are there any questions? While uh, we are waiting for uh, more questions, uh, let me uh, ask you uh, one. Uh, yes. I, I recall that uh, you uh, worked on um, <clears throat> uh, some um, idea uh, mm -hmm. related to trilemma, like uh, throughput, latency, and reliability issue before yes, a yes, few years ago. Yes, I yes. wonder if any of the, uh, the, that paper's idea is actually incorporated in, in, in the, in the uh, in the technique that you uh, uh, presented today? No, this is a different dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so um, 
the way we understand blockchain is that blockchain people are very greedy. Okay. <laughs> So I, I, I don't mean greedy for money. That is also true, but uh, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that they're greedy in the sense that they want to achieve a lot of things with the protocol, okay? They want A, B, and C, okay? They don't want shoes. They want so what we found, sorry, they are very, they want a lot. So what we found in the past few years research is that sometimes it's not possible to achieve several properties simultaneously. Okay, mm -hmm. and so the trilemma is one good example, and uh, this like uh, dilemma is another example, and so what we're trying to formulate is if we cannot achieve all the properties simultaneously, what is the next best thing to do? And we want to design protocols that can achieve the next best thing. So it's related in spirit, but not really in terms of techniques. I see. Okay. So you are uh, interested, like in more like uh, implementable schemes rather than ideal, like uh, like upper bound or that kind of. Oh, I'm greedy. I'm greedy. I want both. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was just telling you why blockchain people are greedy. And I guess I'm a blockchain person, so. Very good. Uh, there's uh, one question uh, from the audience. Uh, can you see the chat board? Yes, I'm reading it right now. It's a bit mm -hmm. long. Uh, yeah. In the Bitcoin protocol, let me just read it out. Maybe people can listen to it. In the Bitcoin protocol, the theorem stated that consensus can be achieved via 50% of the online nodes adversary. Oh, I see. So if it's a if and only if. Um, okay. So it's a typo. It should be if and only if. So you can show that if it's more than 50% of adversary, then transactions can be reversed. So there's a, there's a paper I can point you, if you shoot me an email after the talk, I can point you out to a paper which proved that result by uh, Rafael Pass and Elaine Shi. I just forgot to add the word if and only if here, but mm -hmm. you are very observant. Mm -hmm. I was trying to pronounce the name, but uh, I cannot pronounce the name because it's in Korean. So sorry, <laughs> my, my lack of uh, language here. Good, okay. Does that answer your question, Mr. Sunju Lee? That's the name of uh, the Korean audience. Okay, very good. Yeah, let me type the paper so that you can take a look if you want to. It's pass and she is called rethinking Large scale, I think, consensus. Okay. Um, maybe while we are waiting, uh, uh, if you don't mind, let me ask you like a very general question. Uh, yes. There are a lot of like, uh, uh, you know, you probably know the news from Elon Musk and things like that. There are a lot of noise and like uh, scandals related to, you know, the prices of these blockchains, crypto coins and things like that. Okay. Uh, lately. Uh, I'm actually interested in uh, where the industry is going in terms of governance and in terms of acceptance, uh, like uh, from uh, major uh, maybe countries and governments and, uh, and uh, like acceptance in the, the traditional uh, finance industries. Uh, do you uh, have any idea? Have you ever had any thoughts on where it's going in terms yeah, of- Yeah, there there's definitely a lot of uh, activity here in the Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. Mm -hmm. Lots of VCs are investing in, I think, uh, decentralized finance. DeFi is uh, the many, many projects happening. Mm -hmm. So I think it is moving uh, towards the mainstream. Definitely much more than two years ago, I think, at least in the United States. I don't know about Korea. You know, you know better. 
But right. here, I think it's definitely getting the attention of mainstream. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Ethereum, you can you can tell by looking at the gas price on Ethereum, it's very high right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are a lot of uh, protocols running on Ethereum. So if I ask you a, a naive question, do you think Ethereum will replace Bitcoin or do they, will they coexist in the future, no matter what? Yeah, I think they're two very, they're two pretty different, right? Platforms. I mean, Bitcoin is a, almost entirely a store of value, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people are investing. It's like a, a new asset class, Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Ethereum is supposed to, uh, they do, run smart contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lot of like DeFi applications are running on Ethereum. I don't know whether a lot of DeFi applications are running on Bitcoin. I don't think so. That's true. Yeah. So I think they're serving very different sectors. So I don't think one will replace the other. It's just coexistence. Uh, you... you uh... You briefly mentioned that uh, there's some security problems in e Ethereum 2.0. Uh, what kind of problems are they? And are there some efforts to uh, alleviate that, that? Yes, yes, yes. Right. So mm -hmm. Ethereum 2.0, the protocol is called GASPA. So mm -hmm. that's the one that started off this research. When we analyzed it, what we showed is that the protocol is not live. That means that you can have a liveness attack on the protocol. So, uh, and that attack turns out to be rather practical. It's actually doable with relatively small stick percentage. So you can stop the protocol from moving forward. That's really not good for Ethereum, right? I mean, you're running all these DeFi protocols. And so Vitalik came up with a fix to our attack. Mm -hmm. And uh, they reached out to us just a few weeks ago with this fix. Oh. And they told us that they're now implementing this fix. And they asked us, so what do you think of the fix? So right now we're trying to... So see, uh, the fix basically says, okay, these guys have an attack on our protocol. And our fix basically shows that this attack won't work anymore. But mm -hmm. it's not a security proof of the protocol. In other words, it's not a proof that there are no other attacks possible. Mm -hmm. So now we are working on a new attack on the protocol or to try to prove that the fix is actually secure. So we're collaborating with them on working on this problem right now. Very good, oh, very good news. Um, uh, are there any questions from the audience? Okay, um, are there, actually we are simulcasting uh, uh, through YouTube channels also. Are there any questions from the YouTube? Although there's some delay, there are like about 10 seconds delay from June. I can't see the YouTube channel. I'm, I'm kind of on you, Professor Lee, to, <laughs> yeah, to take I a look relate. and see if there's any question there. Yeah, I can relay questions because I'm watching the screen now. Okay, there's none. Um, oh, in that case, uh, I let uh, let me uh, close the uh, the seminar. Uh, and uh, I I really appreciate your uh, uh, valuable uh, evening time uh, with us, uh, spending your time with us. And uh, I really. Thank you, and uh, it was really, um, you know, um, uh, insightful talk. And uh, there are a lot of things uh, to think about, uh, actually, in terms of blockchain technologies. Because uh, uh, actually, the mass public here is uh, like crazy about uh, only in the investment aspect of blockchain, but they don't know much about the uh, the uh, kind of the technological aspect, which is a bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, disappointing. But anyway, this is very insightful talk. I really appreciate your time. And I think uh, audience will uh, feel the same. 
So, I so think... the thing about thank you very much. So the thing mm-hmm. about giving online talk is I can't have a Korean dinner with you <laughs>、uh, after the talk. So that's a bit of a shame. But、uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Yeah, next time you visit us, I'll,、uh, you know, I'll do so. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much.、I'll, thank you,、uh, Professor Lee. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Bye.